extra water. On such a hot day. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming to this event with the great Thomas Keneally. My name is Leslie McDowell. Uh, we have a special addition to this event, in addition to the Q&A that Thomas and I are going to have about his newest book, The Book of Science and Antiquities. Um, he's going to sing. He's going to sing first. And he's going to say a little bit about the book that he has just finished and that we don't know anything about yet. Um, but before you start, Thomas, just allow me very quickly to say a few things because I was just thinking there's going to be nobody in this audience who doesn't know who this man is or what he's written or what he's done, but needs must. Here we go. Here's a short introduction. Thomas Keneally, born in Sydney a few years ago. You've written over 50 books in a career spanning six decades. You were the first Australian to win the Booker Prize on your fourth nomination, I think. You'd been nominated mm -hmm. three times before that for Schindler's Ark, which of course was made into the film Schindler's List by Steven Spielberg later. Um, he's won a host of literary awards throughout his career, as well as for TV scripts and Lifetime Achievement Awards. He's written about the American Civil War, World War I, World War II, about Australia's Irish ancestry, about its Aboriginal people. He's written about real-life unsung heroes and heroines, as well as the fictional ones. He is apparently, I think officially, Australia's national treasure. <laughs> <laughs> he is also ours because you're going to say, before we talk about this book, and we'll, we'll, we'll discuss what this is about, um, you wanted to talk really about the connection with this city. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, uh, the contribution of this city and of the Scots to Australia is illimitable, uh, but of course our uh, national song, Waltzing Matilda, is based on a Scots air that a poet called Banjo Patterson heard at the races in Warrnambool in, in the extreme south of Australia and then took up to Queensland, travelled about 2,000 miles for love of a, of a girl called Macpherson, <laughs> uh, and she put it to music. Uh, the, uh, uh, she reproduced the music of this air called uh, Ye Bonnie Woods of Craigie Muir. Mm. And uh, it became, as she performed it in a pub in a godforsaken town called Winton after the races, uh, they transmuted that into Waltzing Matilda, which is the unofficial anthem of Australia. And so uh, that is one of the inheritances. And then, of course, it concerns a time of industrial trouble about a shearer who runs into trouble with a squatter, which is our name for a large landowner. Uh, I say a shearer because in New Zealand is pronounced sh here shearer as sharer, S-H-A-R-E-R, -E -R, of sheep. And that's very much a New Zealand vice. New Zealand where the men are men and the sheep are nervous. This man, <laughs> This man is a shearer, so he's a swagman. He carries his swag from station to station, shearing sheep. Uh, and, of course, it goes, once a jolly swagman camped by a billabong, which is an anabranch, a lagoon of a river, uh, under the shade of a coolabar tree, which is a mythic tree under which, in the old days of the bush, they buried stockmen, they bury, buried drovers under the chain of a coolabar tree, and he sang as he watched and waited till his billy boiled. You'll come a-waltzing Matilda with me. Waltzing Matilda, waltzing Matilda, you'll come a-waltzing Matilda with me. And he sang as he and waited till his billy boiled. You'll come a-waltzing Matilda with me. Now, I, I've just finished a book uh, about Dickens' youngest son, and he uh, brought to Australia a passion for a Scotch song called uh, I Fond Kiss, A Fond Kiss. And I've got the lyrics here somewhere, which, uh, uh, and he was on a remote place out beyond uh, the Darling River, 
about two days' drive from Sydney, uh, even these days, and he uh, was singing and performing iPhone Kiss in the homestead, while out beyond the pasture gate, uh, there were the Parkinji people, who are the descendants of the man in this book. Mm. And they were singing their antediluvian songs of the same, perhaps the same sentimentality, uh, drive, recovery of the lost, the desire to recover the lost that was in the voice of 16-year-old young plorn, uh, young plorn uh, Dickens. And that song is a beautiful song, and I'm ashamed to tell you what the Australian, equivalent Australian love song was like. Now, my wife Judy uh, is an authentic descendant of convicts. I am too, I'm afraid, <laughs> but hers are more interesting. I mean, mine con committed sedition, a great uncle, and was sent to Australia. Judy's great-grandfather knocked down a specific door in East Galway in Lawrencetown, while armed, and uttered threats to his landlord. Did him no harm, but was hunted down and sent to Australia for life at the age of 24. He ultimately met up with Judy's great-grandmother who had stolen cloth in Limerick. The family has never uh, been in trouble in Australia. We've got lower standards, of course. But, um, <laughs> but Judy's elder brother did fly 90 missions for Bomber Command, which shows that these people who were spat forth from the system here were nobler than anyone knew. Anyhow, having made that little speech, I must say what happened at the female factory where Judy's great-grandmother was. She was a convict. She, the female factories were where they put the convict women. And 1.8 million Australians are descended from marriages that were made in the female factory. They would send the, 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 the convict who got his ticket of leave would say, well, I'm going bush, but I need a wife. So he'd f stop at the convict, uh, the female factory, and the single girls would parade, and it wouldn't be provocatively, you know, but some of them really badly wanted to get out. <laughs> you can tell that by the blokes they married. Anyhow, uh, and the song that was sung after an hour and a half of courting when the girl, if the girl consented and they're about to be married, the great Australian love song goes, come pack up your swag and let's make a push. I'll take you up the country and I'll show you the bush. I'm sure you won't get such an offer any day. So come and take possession of the old bullet dray. <laughs> And we've been smooth talking and romantic to a fault. <laughs> Whereas, of course, I fond kiss and then, uh, uh, and then we sever. That, if you've ever wanted to hear it sung uh, in a bad Australian accent, then this is your day. <laughs> and as a tribute to Edinburgh and to the Scots in general, would you tolerate a few verses? Yes. I phone kiss, and then we sever. I farewell, alas, forever. Deep in heart wrung, tears I'll pledge thee. Warring sighs and groans I'll wage thee. Who shall say that fortune grieves him? While the star of hope he leaves him, me a cheerful twinkle lights me, deep despair around benights me. I'll ne'er blame my partial fancy, nothing could resist my Nancy. You notice I couldn't do a Scots nothing there. <laughs> nothing. Uh, but, but, but to see her was to love her, love but her, and love forever. Had we never loved, say kindly, 
Had we never loved, say blindly, had we never loved, say blindly, yeah, never met nor never parted, we'd nay be, say broken hearted. And it continues in elegant <laughs> Burnsian strains. Thank you. But I, I hope you get. Uh, I hope you get a buzz out of uh, hearing those Scots lyrics were part of the tongue of the Australian bush. And uh, young Dickens tried to seduce a girl with them, you know, mm. tried to do a Robbie Burns on his Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't quite work. I'm not quite sure how we're going to follow that. But anyway, right, here we go, here we go. We're going to talk today about this book, The Book of Signs and Antiquities, also known in Australia, I think the Australian title is Two Old Men Dying. Yes, it's about two old men dying, yes. But it is also about beginnings in as much as it's about endings mm. as well. It, it's the parallel stories of, of Shelby. There's a contemporary story, Shelby, who is a documentary filmmaker. Um, he's dying of cancer. He wants to see the return of this skeleton of what's known as the learned man. It's a, a 42,000 year old skeleton of a, a tribal elder found in a learned lake in Aboriginal land. Um, and it, he predates what historians thought when uh, Indigenous people were alive at that time on that land. Um, and you give him his voice, Shade, so there's a 42,000 year old man, and there's Shelby. Both of them are, are, are tasked with, with, with novels, with, with, with quests in this novel, but I wanted to start with a, a little passage, if you don't mind, that I'd like to quote. Shelby's talking about his friend Peter, who is the one who discovered the learned man. And he says, he's arguing about it because he's having to fight to get this recognized. And he says, Peter Jorgensen discovered us. Learned is who we are and who we were at a forgotten level. Peter Jorgensen gave us back our memory. And I wanted to ask initially to start off with, is that what historical fiction is for you? Is it about what is forgotten? Is it about that forgotten level, a giving back of memory. And, and what resonates in, the, in our era too, yes, forgotten uh, memory, because uh, when I was a kid in school, uh, the Aboriginals, uh, pre-European, were depicted as living in miserable gunyas, uh, a sort of flaccid dead kangaroo by their fire, uh, naked, mother, father, a couple of um, uh, little native kids who in those days we called pickaninnies under the, we read the Boris Johnson <laughs> history of the world. But um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, the life of Homo sapiens in Australia was far richer than that. Mm -hmm. Since And would you like me to talk about the richness yes. in which, um, yes, yes. because Mungo uh, is the real, the man's real name. He's called Mungo Man. I called him Learned Man for the sake of fiction. Uh, he lived 42,000 years ago uh, on a lake which was brimming at that stage of history. Uh, it was full of Murray Cod, as they're called now. It was full of eels, sea creatures, frequented by large birds, uh, most of them still in existence, but frequented too by huge uh, uh, marsupials uh, that were, some of whom have died out. A two and a half ton uh, wombat like creature called the Diprotodon. Uh, it was vegetarian, it was very unfierce. It was great, a great haunch of Diprotodon would feed an entire assembled tribe at a big seasonal feast. Uh, and then giant kangaroos, nine feet high. Uh, a 12 feet long lizards, and lizards are very good uh, eating white meat. <laughs> Uh, very good for you cholesterol-wise, etc. And uh, the uh, 
uh, therefore they lived in a, a in a world of plenty. And unlike the naked people, they weren't too dumb to know that kangaroo cloaks made very nice wear for the winter. Or, uh, and uh, uh, therefore there was a Stone Age technology, but uh, their life, I think, was more sophisticated than, uh, I'm of Irish descent, uh, I think the Irish and the Scots round about then, there might be an expert in the crowd who can tell us, round about 42,000 years ago were in Central Asia, making their way with signs saying Edinburgh or bust. <laughs> uh, and I don't think our life was quite as benign and convenient as the lives of these people. And so uh, I, I wanted to try to correct our view of, of the Aboriginals uh, uh, as hapless fringe dwellers, uh, which um, uh, I, I wanted to show a society that was ahead of our society at that time. Uh, and also say, uh, Mungo Man, if we see what he tells us, uh, the antiquity of your European occupation, uh, of, sorry, Homo sapiens occupation of Australia, we can no longer despise the people who were there. So I, I see Mungo Man, there, there was even a bit of an apostolic impulse behind this. I think Mungo Man is the answer to racial tension in Australia, to racial igno mutual ignorance, uh, that he's a reconciling figure, and that he is, in a sense, a prophet. He was found, the Aboriginals, um, uh, particularly an old mutty mutty woman uh, in Western New South Wales, said to my friend um, Jim Bowler, who found him in the rock, in the sediments of the uh, shore of the lake, she said, you didn't find Mungo Man, Mungo Man found you. He had something to tell people. Uh, our Conservative politicians have no interest at all in someone who's 20 times, um, uh, tw uh, 20 times older than Ramses. Uh, he uh, uh, th th I, and I was trying to get them to collaborate with, and so is Jim Bowler, collaborate with the elders of the three tribes who are just, have traditional ownership of that lake and decide to make Mungo's bones uh, a, a scene of world pilgrimage. A small thing, but uh, the other thing about him was that he's the first ritual burial that we have. He was covered with ochre, which came from 200 miles away, and thus, in the country in which young Dickens was uh, a, a jackaroo or a drover, a cowboy, and, or a sheep boy. And, um, uh, you know, I, I still think one day Mungo will be a, 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 a site to which he's now in, buried in a depository under a underfunded interpretation centre. Mm. Uh, but one day he'll be a place of pilgrimage because he's too important to all of us. Um, and... Uh, so uh, it's time I stop ranting and let you <laughs> ask a question. Well, I was going to say, you, you partly answer one of the questions I wanted to, to put to you about whether you choose the subjects or whether the subjects come to you a little bit, because you, you, you kind of said that anyway, I think, a little bit there. But there's also the, the issue, it, it feeds into the issue of the fact that you, and you acknowledge this at the start, you apologise, you ask for forgiveness for writing about this indigenous person from four to 2,000 years ago. Yes. Are you the right person to be doing that? And, and that was brought up as it Yes, was indeed. Uh, when I was young, I wrote about Aboriginals and, and I've since uh, uh, done penance for that. Uh, uh, Aboriginal writers have proliferated. I, I think we should, I'm not strict. I think men can write, if they're as sensitive of me, as me, of course, <laughs> can write from a woman's point of view. Mm. But, and I'm not, uh, dogmatic about the question of cultural mm -hmm. uh, attribution, but uh, I, I think that it's mere good manners to um, cons 
to make sure you're not insulting the other race. So my daughter and I have written a string of books about um, uh, penal stations in New South Wales and a convict called Montserrat, who, uh, an educated convict, who solves this string of, not because he's bright, because he isn't, uh, but because he needs to solve this string of murders to keep his ticket of leave and to go back and see his girlfriend, mm. who turned, uh, they no sooner reunited than they split. But nonetheless, uh, these books, uh, particularly my daughter, but I do it too, uh, um, subjects any book she writes to uh, an Aboriginal consultant and, and, and pays them to read it. And they're, they're very um, lenient and genial people. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not, uh, uh, they, above all, they just don't want to be misunderstood and insulted given that we stole the whole country from them. <laughs> um, given that you may not have found that necessarily the hardest part of writing, this book, but I did, I did wonder if, in terms of historical research, they often say, well, it's, it's the gaps in the story you look for. You don't want yeah. too much historical information because yeah. you want room for imagination. Was it, <laughs> it's 42,000 years ago, is it the opposite? Is it just like too much? <laughs> too much of a space <laughs> it, to imagine? It is a big space uh, to, to cover because you can't you use words like, to the north appeared. <laughs> uh, you can't uh, use measurements, even once not sure what the time measurements were. I'm sure there was a measurement for day. And then the names of these animals that some of whom are still around, like the normal kangaroos and emus and so on, they were still, and goannas, uh, uh, they were around then also. But the megafauna, uh, that is a test to decide what you're going to call what scientists now call the diprotodon. Two and a half ton wombat, easy to hunt. The only problem is you shouldn't be there when it falls over. Uh, <laughs> uh, and there was a wonderful line then related to the giant, ca uh, giant koalas called the marsupial line. And it had a thumb like a koala. So it killed by jumping up to a person or an animal, slitting its throat, and then severing its cord at the back. And it could kill, according to uh, computer modeling, uh, in less than a minute, which is 15 times faster than many of the kills of modern lions. Uh, and I don't know if you've ever been on safari, you've seen a cheetah with a, a, a little antelope in its mouth and the cheetah drops the antelope dead at last or moribund and he's panting like crazy because he's been holding it in his mouth. He hasn't been, or sh she, it's, it's very like, it, it's very like the male world I in which the m men do, the, the human world in which men do the preening and, and women do the work <laughs> uh, and the hunting and it's the women uh, who, who are the hunters in the big cat families. Uh, but um, that exhaustion, the marsupial line didn't have that mm -hmm. and the slicer, uh, as it's called in the book, would have been a big fact in the life of those people who lived on the shores of Lake Mungo. Uh, they would have been told, don't, uh, uh, children would have been told, you know, beware of the slicer, or they would have been told, if you see one called mummy, or they would have been told, we'll feed you to the slicer if you're not a good boy. <laughs> in spite of that, in spite of that, it's, what I think this book has, which I think a lot of your historical fiction has, is there's an element of hope. It's interesting, I think, that you often pick sort of individuals who are faced with something overwhelming, whether it's the Holocaust, as in mm -hmm. you've, got, you've got World War II and Daughters of Mars, so on, and you have it here as well. You've got that basically 
life and death struggle every single day. I wondered if that was your kind of view of things generally, that you don't subscribe to a, a fatalistic view, you do subscribe to hope. You put an individual at the centre of something and, and there's, there's always a chance that they can just come yes. from it. Yes, uh, I, I think I'm a, a bit of an uh, optimist, or as Mary Robinson said this morning, Bishop Tutu said, I'm not optimistic to a journalist, I'm just a prisoner of hope. <laughs> and when you see, when you recreate how Mungo lived 42,000 years ago, how humble it was, how human it was, and how brave, uh, it... it it reverberates, it, mm -hmm. it, it's something to sing about. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something to celebrate, even though those humans passed down to our, I mean, we're the best poets and the best killers in the world. And uh, that tension between being poets, the great singers of the animal world, mm -hmm. we are. And also, uh, we managed to make those megafauna extinct. Uh, and uh, therefore we are, we're, we're tougher than the slicer. We're yeah. tougher than the marsupial line. Yeah, you always give your characters, I think, room to act. There's, it's, it's never that sort of Hardy-esque view of fate, crushing them down. They always, they always manage to, even Shelby in here, he's, he's dying, mm. but even here, you give him a chance. You give both men, actually, a chance to kind of act. They're yes. not completely. Shelby is, is um, it's interesting, Shelby, uh, the ma uh, Shade, the old man, the 42,000 year old man, has the law between him and his community. He carries around the lens through which he looks at everything and it's the law and it's what his hero ancestors tell him because in Aboriginal sleep, it is common to, to go to heaven and be given messages by your hero ancestor who made the earth you live on. Uh, and he is uh, often a, tr a sleep traveler, uh, Mungo man or learned man as he is in this. And he's got the law between him and even between him and his relationship with the hero ancestor. And then he, uh, um, the, the other man, Shelby, the, the modern man, uh, is uh, he has the lens between himself and the world. And in his life, he's always trying to figure out um, things like why mm. the people of the Bering Strait, the Inuit and Yupik, have the same rights as Australian Aboriginals. When is there going to be another random burst of development in our brain, which is going to go towards reconciling those two realities, the great singers of the earth and the great killers of the earth, make the polarity not quite as extreme as it is. And uh, so Shelby is, uh, with his camera, he, he's not prepared to make the journey without a lens. Uh, and he's looking into these questions pole to pole to his dying day. And even when he's getting chemo chemotherapy, uh, he sees women come in, young women, uh, with their uh, ha uh, hair in bandanas or their lack of hair, lack of hair in bandanas. And he thinks of um, breast cancer and ovarian cancer and sends himself into that question. He asks, he dares to ask, he's a bit of a breasts man, <laughs> which I don't think is punishable really. And he wonders with admiration about uh, breast cancer and the survival of love through mastectomy. And, the, and he says, this is the great unwritten novel should be written by a woman who's been through it. Um, and uh, thinking, therefore, all the time. And he would probably 
make a documentary on that question mm. if he had time. But he, he's dying of esophageal cancer. I wrote the book, I had a few esophageal tumors and they were fixed and then I wrote the book and killed him with the operation for esophageal cancer. And Not three spoilers, no spoilers. And, and three <laughs> months later, I found I had to have the same operation. <laughs> and so uh, thanks to uh, Judy, who had every opportunity to knock me off and be, uh, be a fancy free woman, um, she uh, nursed me so well mm. that uh, I was okay with that operation. Mm. Um, but it is a, it, it, you could imagine it killing someone who was weak because uh, there's so much anaesthetic and so many, uh, it, it's weird. You're as mad as a meat ax for about a month. <laughs> but there's another, there's another correlation, I think, between you and, and the character Shelby in, in the novel, which is that he is this documentary filmmaker. He is a kind of seeker after the truth, if you like. Yes. He knows it's more complicated than that. He knows he's, he's his Oscar is for, for when he's in Vietnam. Um, I think you are quite similar, or I wondered if you thought that you were quite similar. It seems to me that you are a writer of historical fiction who is, has that sort of journalist eye for the truth. You're after the truth of a story. Yes, it's, it's uh, I went to Eritrea uh, during the war between Ethiopia and Eritrea, and I was re really out of my depth. So then, for the experience of being out my death, I, depth, I went back a number of times. But, uh, no, I don't know why I went back. But in any case, I was preceded there by a doctor who was actually born in New Zealand. And uh, he was a great character. His name was Fred Hollows. He dressed like a plumber. He used to go out in the bush. He started a crusade for Aboriginal eye health. He thought it was disgraceful that the original Australians were subject to uh, epidemic levels of cataract blindness. And then he applied his philosophy to the rest of the world and he went to Eritrea and started there groups of um, health workers who went around performing the cataract operation. And when he was dying, he bullied the Australian government into putting up the money for an interocular lens facility in Asmara. Uh, and that interocular lens facility plays a part in, in this novel. But Shelby is a weak man like me, and he's led by prophets like Fred, who was called something else. Mm. But Fred used to boss me round, you know. <laughs> you, you, you know, why don't you come up and write something real about eye health in the territory? Uh, and uh, he used to boss everyone round, including the doctors. In he, he was a delightful bully, and he described himself as an. Um, anarchist syndicalist, and he was. He was a man who was an enemy of regulation and a um, sort of a follower of unofficial, uh, an extoller of unofficial but well-trained activism. And um, he, uh, uh, he, he travels with Shelby in the book. He's a he used to he was, used to talk like a plumber too. He used to go out in the bush. He'd say, uh, "G'day, love," uh, to an Aboriginal woman. Give, give us a look at your eyes. Oh, Jesus, that's not too bloody good, is it? <laughs> so he was that sort. He was a a prophet, and he used to recite Keats out in the desert. He used to love uh, love Keats. He was a a Bain, popular, demotic prophet. Uh, he said uh, he married a beautiful woman who's almost as bossy as he was. And she was of Irish descent, Irish convict descent, like my wife, who is an, a, 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 a very retiring little creature, <laughs> not assertive at all. And uh, uh, he said, uh, Gabby wants me to send the, uh, the, the, the kids to a Catholic school and uh, it, it's a funny, I've promised to do it, it's a funny bloody promise for an anarchist syndicalist to make. But he said, uh, after a while I thought from what I've seen 
That's the quickest bloody way to make them communists anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> and so he's a character who had to be written and he's in the book. And I was with him in Eritrea once when his hand trained doctor went off. Masawa was captured down on the Red Sea from the Ethiopians. And this young man went off to do, uh, to do uh, uh, combat eye surgery. And when he got back to Arota, this hospital dug into the side of mountains in the Ethiopian highlands, when he got back, Fred ripped into him and uttered names, uh, uh, words that should perhaps go over university entrances. Uh, he said, listen, Des, the doctor's name was Des Belay. He said, I, I brought you to Australia to train you for six bloody years and it costs us the bloody earth and you're gonna go off and fritter it all away, get hit down in Masawa and what good's that gonna do anyone? He said, uh, any silly bugger can be Che bloody Guevara, but very few good eye surgeons exist. So you stick to your bloody last, mate. <laughs> Except he didn't say bloody. He's, an, <laughs> he's never guilty of such a mild expletive. Uh, <laughs> now, you see, that, that is actually kind of what intrigues me about, again, your, your approach to historical fiction. And, and I'm, I'm going to come away from this just for a wee second. Because you were writing from the 60s on, you wrote through that period when historical fiction took on that postmodern view of Mm -hmm. the sort of you know muddying the sources it, it was hard, you know it's not one truth it's multiple truths and it, it's it's hard to establish what what's really going on you've got Gabriel Garcia Marquez you've got writers like that throwing up this notion of history you it seems to me kind of played a slightly different pharaoh with it and I wondered if it makes me think now I wonder now if that play with history and with truth at the time which seemed very subversive is now perhaps less so given the way that we are facing things like fake news and everything could be a lie or it could be the truth. Uh, yeah. Sorry, um, I was just gonna carry on by saying, if you, do you think if you were writing Schindler's arc now, do you think it would be different for you? Yes, it would have to be a different tone and maybe a uh, whole different discourse in the book. Uh, but the thing about Oscar was that he, um, again, he was a lens, an imaginable lens on a limited number of people, but he saw the Holocaust, through, he saw every phase of the Holocaust uh, because he was there. He was involved in the confiscation of apartments and businesses. He was involved in the Gentile, uh, Gentiles and Nazis taking over Jewish business. Then the detention of uh, Jews in their own quarter. Uh, then the use of them as cheap labor. Uh, the use of them in camps at, uh, uh, the, the big camp was at Poishov and he built his own camp in the yards of his own factory in, uh, within Krakow itself, so his people didn't have to be marched every day. Uh, and then he saw the destruction machine, because he reported all that to, he whistled blue on all that uh, in early 1943, when he went in a uh, carriage of newspapers down to Budapest, which was then unoccupied by the Germans, and uh, passed the news on to two German Jewish agents who said, I knew them, they were still alive while I was writing the book, and I interviewed them, they said they couldn't believe, as Germans, you know, uh, as German Jews, they couldn't believe that Germans were gassing Jews already uh, uh, or, or at all. Uh, and uh, Oscar seemed to have a lot of news on that. It's my theory he was German military intelligence's man on the SS, uh, looking at the processes. At that stage, uh, he, had wit he had heard or witnessed a number of 
uh, carbon monoxide poisonings, where they put people in a chamber or the back of a truck. And they were just starting to get on to the Zyklon B um, as the supposed humane way of killing people. And so um, I would have to, but I, I would tell the story in the tone of this age and in the tone of, of uh, the fact that people would assume it was fake news and propaganda for Zionists, etc., is that some, sometimes rarely, thank God, accused of being, but uh, the, uh, you know, you are, your book is of its age. Uh, and the, the books that can b both be of their age and survive. Of course, Dickens is, the, Dickens is incredible, except for women. He's, a, he's only good at women he doesn't fancy. If he's writing <laughs> about a woman he fancies, she, he transmutes her into an arch, archangel, you know. She has no flaws, and even Dora, whom David Copperfield dumps, her flaws are very minuscule. Uh, and uh, uh, George Eliot, now there's a writer who knows women. Someone told me once that they thought jo uh, Dickens's women were children and monsters. Yes, it's, that's it's, right. It's, it's kind of one or the other. But it, it comes back to us a little bit about your career, having had such a long career. The way that you write, the way that you approach subjects, has that changed from over the over the decades do you do you, you find yourself getting more political or less political or angrier about things or no i, I i'm really uh uh much um more combative i i hope in a nice way i've really behaved myself for these scots because <laughs> i'm an uh, irish australian hillbilly and they're respectable Presbyterians, so I'm doing my best. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, uh, combativeness is, is an indulgence at this stage of history because it's so accept, you answer people's questions. Uh, I'm appalled at the behavior of the Australian government. It's not as bad as the government of Sudan under Bashir, but we have, tormented people in offshore detention centers. We are, uh, we have a government that, uh, a prime minister who has brought a lump of coal into parliament and has said, uh, uh, there's nothing to be fear of, uh, uh, feared of, it's just a lump of coal. Done a stunt with a lump of coal as if coal is the future. He, he is uh, tone deaf to the future. He's tone deaf about what we, sh how we're going to uh, employ or pay our children not to be employed in the future. He, he is the, uh, an artist of short-termism. Uh, he is building, he's trying to get an Indian company uh, going on a coal mine which uh, in the Galilee Basin, which will threaten the, the runoff of treated water into the uh, Pacific, will destroy the Barrier Reef. Uh, for the sake of 1,700 jobs, this uh, coal mine has become talismanic of everything. So the urgency, the onset of fascist thought, uh, mm -hmm. the urgency makes you yell a bit or else it just makes you sit uh, with a placard. Mm. And um, I, 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 a few of us are trying to work out a protest, such as walking from Sydney to Canberra, which is about distances are, are, are big. Uh, in, a, in Australia, it's, it's funny, uh, we think of Glasgow and Edinburgh, as yeah. I was saying earlier, as two poles of the Scottish equation, you know, the wild pagan <laughs> side and the respectable side. Ian Rankin has <laughs> undermined the respectability of, of Edinburgh no end, <laughs> but uh, they're only 48 miles apart. You know, yeah. Sydney to Melbourne is uh, 700 kilometres. 
Yeah. And so if you're visiting someone, as we were recently, you, to drive to the country Dickens was in uh, takes a day and a half and you're still in the same state. Mm -hmm. So Margaret Atwood recently uh, performed at the Sydney Opera House and she sang a song about Canada, about what Canada had to boast of. So her song was, Canada's very big <laughs> <laughs> and Australia's very big. Uh, but so walking to Canberra is, is quite a trek and we'd like to reproduce Gandhi's salt march. Mm. But the question is, what are we going to carry in our hands as a reproach to the uh, many-headed, the hydra-headed stupidity of our government? And um, uh, I, I, that's what we're trying to work out. I hope I can still walk by the time they do. You could always sing it. There seems to be a fashion amongst writers for singing at the moment. I don't know what that is. Mark ah, is yeah, well. Yeah. But we've only got, we've got 10 minutes left, so I'm just going to turn it over quickly for any questions. Only 10 minutes left? I know, I know. I've and I've been terrified <laughs> all. I know, I, I could see, I could see <laughs> you were just terrified <laughs> to say a word. Does anybody have a question that they would like, if we can keep the questions quite short so we can get a few in, that would be great. Does anyone have a question for Tom? There's one up there, yeah. Hey, Thomas, thanks so much. Um, my grandmother grew up in Warrnambool and we're all pure convict stock but it's funny being over here what you miss. I'm curious, um, do you still miss what you missed from Australia when you're young? When uh, I worked in American universities for a time, NYU where uh, Salman Rushdie told me he now works and, and um, it's a great place to work as a young, plausible person, passing himself off as a scholar. Uh, because there are bars on the ground floor, you know, <laughs> really good bars. And uh, what I miss is, curiously, I've got half my grandfather's family in America and the other half in Australia. The half that are in America don't get sudden yearnings to see Australian landscape and to be amongst the gods that live in the European landscape are not the same gods that live the antediluvian gods, like the antediluvian Gondwanan animals and, and, and trees and shrubs that populate our bush, a different set of spirits in the landscape. And I miss those spirits. Mm. I also, in, in, in America, missed uh, the peculiar self-deprecatory humor of Australians. Australians are self-deprecatory uh, 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 all the time. They don't, if anyone else is, uh, is uh, is uh, abusive of them or takes them down. They hate it, <laughs> but they are uh, dismissive of themselves. And that is kind of charming after some years of American earnestness. <laughs> uh, and you begin to, of course, the Scots have that, uh, that too, uh, that self-deprecatory. I think we got it from the Scots and the Irish and the people of Northern England. It's typical of, um, of them. Yeah. Uh, and so the ghosts and the perverted denial of narcissism uh, of the Australians, while actually being as narcissistic <laughs> as everyone else, uh, is something I miss greatly <laughs> after a time. Brilliant. Another question, please. Wave about if I can, so I can see your, your hand. Has anyone got another question? Yes, there's a gentleman there. Uh, excellent talk. Uh, did you get a chance to see the Secret River or have you seen it in Australia before? And what are your opinions? I read, uh, I, this is a, a novel by, by Judy, what's his name? Uh, what's her name, you know? The redhead from Canberra. 
Gr uh, gr uh, yes. Oh, Kate Grenville, yes. Kate Grenville. Yeah. Now, she's a fine writer, and she's really revivified through her fiction that early period of Sydney. And uh, I think it's brilliant, the novel. And I'm seeing uh, it next week. We're being taken by an Australian irreverent novelist called Kathy Lett. <laughs> uh, and she's going to take us uh, at the National Theatre. I believe that it's been up here, and an Aboriginal woman, uh, one of the Aboriginal actors died up here, yeah. Mm, yes. Uh, I, I wrote a book about being on tour with an Aboriginal troupe. Uh, it's called uh, Flying Hero Class because of the concentration of Aboriginal culture on hero ancestors. And um, uh, it, it, it is uh, wonderful. They do have a wonderful take on places like New York and Connecticut, where I was with them, and then uh, on Edinburgh, because we white Australians were raised, particularly in my day and earlier days, to think of our culture as being up here. Mm. That's why we're so late to have our own literature. Uh, we could be batsmen, we're allowed to participate in foreign wars, we could be <laughs> fast bowlers, uh, we could uh, doctor cricket balls with sandpaper, but <laughs> the question was, could we be novelists? Mm. Uh, and um, uh, the, uh, I, I forget where I was going uh, now. About Kate Granville? Kate Granville is one of the uh, efflorescences of uh, of coming to terms with our origins because our origins are in two senses um, or uh, two senses different from anyone else, our European or our settler origins, in that in America you had the Pilgrim Fathers who were too good for England, too good for nearly anywhere landing and sanctifying the earth and having thanksgiving. In Australia, you had people who'd been ex exiled by the best judges in the country and they were pre-fallen Adam and Eve. Mm. And that's very kinky, I love that. <laughs> the fact they were pre-fallen. And um, so... Uh, so yeah, you're sources with, with Kate. Yeah, Kate, yeah. Uh, Kate brings that, puts a new perception mm -hmm. on that phenomenon. Her ancestor was a, uh, uh, was Solomon Wiseman, uh, a convict, and he went up on the Hawkesbury to get away from the authorities and ran head in on into this uh, Aboriginal issue. And indeed, um, north of Sydney, Wiseman's Ferry is a famous beauty spot now, uh, north of Sydney, the, the name of Solomon Wiseman. Uh, I know a fellow who's actually descended from the man on whom, uh, on whom uh, Fagan is based. Ah. Yes, uh, in Tasmania. He, he's, his home has now become a subway uh, outlet. Uh, <laughs> it's terrible what history will do uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. to itself. <laughs> I, I met a woman who once sat on James Joyce's knee. That's, that's my ah. There's a gentleman there with a question, yeah. As a child, I should say, she sat on his knee. Mm. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm, I'm curious whether the, the, uh, the film versions of Chant of Jimmy Blacksmith and Anne Schindler's List in any way, and particularly given the great success that both of those films had, um, did that alter your relationship to the original stories that you wrote? Uh, would you like to talk about that? Well, no, uh, uh, in so far as um, Fred Skepsi, a man who's made a lot of good films, an Italian, Irish, Melburnian, uh, and the man who famously put his arm round Meryl Streep to give her direction and said, well, Meryl, you old tart, what I want you to do, <laughs> or, uh, and so on. Uh, I knew from working with Fred and other directors in the 1970s 
that the directors, I only learned it gradually, but I knew it by the time Fred made the chant of Jimmy Blacksmith, uh, they look upon a book not as a gift they must uh, make a comic book of. They look upon it entirely as a springboard. They also don't have the economies of narration that novelists have far greater uh, elbow room for narration and uh, uh, therefore they have to find one thread amongst all the threads and follow it from beginning uh, to end. And I became uh, aware, therefore, in the 70s that the director doesn't feel any more duty to the original text than a diver to the diving board. <laughs> um, however, good directors worry about the text. They do relate to the text. In, in um, Poland, uh, Spielberg always had the pages from the book on his monitor as well as uh, the pages from the script that he was filming. And uh, when I first saw it, I thought he was trying to flatter me, but he kept doing it for s three months. So <laughs> intelligent directors do, but they're not going to be, they're not going to subject their impulse and their imagination to the text. Mm -hmm. And the sooner the writer works out, the less heartbreak. So there is a scene in Schindler, which makes a lot of people cry, where he goes, he says uh, he's going to escape. And he says to his prisoners that he could have sold his Mercedes. He could have, the truth is he couldn't uh, have done that. That is utter fiction because he already had, as you'll find from the book, his factory uh, to the limits of occupation. He had to uh, reassure some visiting SS engineers that people in beds in his boiler room were about to die. Uh, one of them was a woman who ultimately immigrated to Sydney and she lived into her late 80s. My friend Baldek, uh, his wife uh, Mila is uh, there in the film. Uh, she's living, uh, going to be 97 this year. <gasps> And uh, she survived a, a bout of sickness that began in Auschwitz and ended in Schindler's factory. There was nowhere else for these girls, and they were only girls, uh, to survive in the Reich. Mm. Uh, and that was his triumph. He, he also took in moribund men from a number of uh, carriages that pulled up in uh, Zwetal, uh, railway yards. Mm -hmm. uh, he found piles of uh, moribund people, uh, frostbitten, uh, ice on them, and he, uh, he took them into the factory as well without any authorization. So that scene is as false as a uh, three pound euro. <laughs> but um, the uh, there is, I suppose, a kind of poetic truth to it. Yeah. So they're not going to let the literalness of the uh, script get in the way of the narrative convenience. Yeah, exactly. I really, really don't want to have to stop you, but I'm going to get thrown out, so we do actually have to stop there. Thomas is going to be next door in the signing tent where you are perfectly free to ask him questions, obviously by his book. Um, and talk to him about whatever you like. He'd be happy to talk to you. And I just want to say, if you please thank him for this. It's been wonderful. Thank, thank you so you much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take you through. Okay. <laughs>